Hi everyone, welcome back to the Get A Brew channel. So today we're at the uh, Hartford Brewery and we're going to take a look inside. McMullins or Max are the other names that you might know them as. So um, the traditional brew house originated here in this beautiful building just behind me. So um, copper, kettle, um, oak <laughs> fermentation, really, really, really traditional. So come on in and check it out. Okay, so we're going to take you in and show you inside the brewery. Go this way. Yeah, yeah. Colin kindly gave me a tour. He's just walked away there um, just before and uh, gave me an insight into what they do here. They have a 500 litre brew house, a pilot system for allowing them to do experimental brews. And if one of their pubs requires something that little bit um, more unusual, they'll facilitate them. So we go up into the brew house. You can see here, large mash tun. So you can see the mash tun. Looks like as if there's two sparging arms there coming in from both sides. And a nice um, false bottom on the base of it there. And some rakes, kettle, and then we have the holding vessel, which is if they're brewing large scale batches, they would take off the first half, um, put the, the wort in there, and then continue to uh, produce the second batch. This is a hop back, and if we take you nice. just, just through here. Okay, so this is obviously where dry goods comes in, so you can see we're surrounded by um, hops and malt. We've got the specialty malt from French and & Jobs, um, we've got the base malts um, from Crisp, and then obviously a selection of all different varieties of hops from New Zealand hops and um, British hops as well. Um, so yeah, nice aroma in here. So this takes us upstairs into the milling area. The guys are in, obviously giving uh, the mill a service today, a beautiful looking mill. You can see the bottom of the grist case just over there where they would obviously um, do the milling before it goes into the mash tun. Nice little lab in the background here to carry out their analysis tests. Coming out of the brewery platform floor there, um, come down here, you can see Ward cooling, which is basically a, a plate heat exchanger. Find this really interesting over here. Um, obviously, one of the unique things that they do here is they um, use their own yeast. So, I initially thought this was a mash filter, and it's actually a, a yeast filter to remove the yeast cake. So, you can see, <laughs> like an incredible piece of kit. Basically, what it does is it separates the wort from the yeast. The yeast is collected in these little uh, trolleys at the bottom and then is obviously kept refrigerated. Now cleaning regime is going to have to be shit hot and obviously we've tasted the quality of the beer and the beer is incredible. Had a pint in the hotel last night and I just said to Colin when he was giving me the tour, I was really impressed with the quality of the beer. To then see that they're um, you know, using this um, filter uh, to get the yeast cake out, I was like, well surely your cleanliness would need to be like the attention to detail, they need to be phenomenal. He's like, yeah, we caustic clean it before and after. So look at something new, every day's a school day and all that. Fermentation farm, you can see selection of tank sizes here. I think they can, um, they usually brew either 5,000 or 10,000 liter batches. And whenever they're brewing a 5,000 liter batch, they just switch on the cooling and the base of the fermenter. If it's 10,000, switch it on in the full size of the fermenter. So we're gonna take you over and show you the, uh, packaging area. As you come in you'll see a uh, small selection of 30 litre steel kegs and then something that we, <laughs> we don't see a lot of in Irish breweries is casks. So you've got firkins and pins. My understanding is this size is roughly 40 litres, this size is roughly 20 litres. Um, I know they tend to work in barrels and gallons in British breweries when they're describing whereas we would be more used to working in litres. Um, so cask cleaning and filling line here, a keg cleaning and filling line here, and then uh, one of the unique things they do at uh, Max is they do personalised beer labels and things. So they have a six head filler, um, which caps two bottles at a time. I think uh, Colin was saying that they can get 
roughly 400 bottles an hour, which I was really <laughs> um, pleasantly surprised to hear, which shows that the work ethic here is phenomenal. A team of five people um, managing all of this is a credit to them. Um, so look, we're going to go and hear a little bit about the history. We're going to go and enjoy some beers and uh, hopefully learn a little bit more about regional breweries and Cascale. So hello and welcome to Max. Um, so I'm Tom McMullen, so I'm one of the three family members that works in the business. The story starts all the way back in 1790. So William McMullen comes across from Ireland and he is part of the household of the Marquess of Downshire. He's actually a gardener. And the Marquess has moved over to Hartford and he's hired Hartford Castle. Still a lot of our existing brands today have history that goes all the way back. So for example, our number one beer uh, in the bottles used to be called Farmer's Ale and that goes back a long time as well. Hartford, when we founded here, there were 12 other breweries. It was a great centre of both malting and brewing um, because, of course, it's got the four rivers that come into town, the canal system that goes into the one, you know, the biggest market in the country, i.e. London. Um, and then, of course, I mean, you'll know far more about this than I do, but the malting industry in Hartford declined materially. Um, you know, partly the, the sea routes around East Anglia opened up and then the impact of the railway lines and malted barley coming from the north. So, I mean, it's, it's a, you know, it's, brilliant that we've still got a maltster that is five miles, I think I measured it, five miles down, down the river. Um, you know, and, and one day I would love to do a kind of field to glass video where we actually, because I mean I farm uh, and we grow malted barley and it goes to North Hearts Farmers Group which then I think supplies French and Jupps that gets to here again and so the circle is I mean utterly perfect and all we need to do is get the spent grain or the digest and put it back on the farm again and it's a perfect loop. Beers have changed, you know. So we we went through the kind of craft phase. I think in about the the 70s and 80s. Um, so we did the right thing at the wrong time. You know, at the stage when everybody wanted to drink, or Foster's was trying to get into all of our pubs. We didn't even have lager at this stage. You know, we were trying to do wonderfully flavoured pilsners and the likes, and it was just didn't catch because it was the wrong thing at the wrong time. After that, we then just went back to just brewing cask beer. And, and although we were doing seasonal rotational products that were changing every six weeks or so, our core range of cask beer didn't really change. And so about six years ago, we were like, clearly we need to, we need to become more market orientated. We need to start developing and changing our products faster. It was a complicated process because clearly the craft sector at that stage just didn't want established brewers to be coming in into the more contemporary market. So we had to sort of slowly integrate the two together, uh, which is where Rivertown as a concept was founded. Um, so this is, I mean, initially we had something called Ambush Beer, which is where we then were brewing utterly incognito uh, and then sort of then were confident enough to then put it into a, an individual brand. Um, but the idea of the brewery and, and why the, the FV and the fermentation um, conditioning barrels have all reduced in size is that we need to do much smaller runs, much more flexibly and fast. So we need to be constantly able to change products. And I said um, to Paul, you know, even you know, some of the big pubs, if they say, right, you know, we need to have a Hells, you know, we need to be prepared to be able to brew them a hell specifically for that pub. So being really fleet of foot um, is important. The development of hops and how hop taste has changed and where we're drawing hops from around the world has been a huge sort of growth sector. And one of the things I would love to see is sort of, and of course that's what a lot of people talk about is the hops that goes in the product. But actually I think there's a lovely story to be having, having on the malt and how, how the malt pitcher can be developed and, and celebrated. Uh, and for us, you know, a lot of that will be about provenance and locality uh, and imagery, but you know, I think there is not enough understood about the different tastes that the different malts or the, the, the colour impacts that you have. The, the brutal reality is, is that cask is having a torrid, torrid time. You know, its volume as a percentage of the total draft has been on a, on a long-term slide. And one of the reasons why we really had to move into, this is all kegged, one of the reasons we had to move into that is that the long-term future of cask, and we will always brew cask because it's such a fundamental part of our heritage, but we now brew as much keg as we now do cask. Th th those that advocate cask really strongly will go, first of all, you can't get a competitor cask in a supermarket. It is the only product that can only be offered in the on-trade. So th th you know, those that brew cask will say to the distribution system, and the on-trade, you know, look after this because you know, otherwise all you have is a substitute product that you can buy cheaper in a supermarket. And this is where cask has become so vulnerable, is that um, it is not valued correctly. So cask to brew is not too dissimilar to keg, but to keep it, 
properly in a pub and serve it properly is really, really hard. And also, you have yield challenges. You know, realistically, you're not going to be able to sell exactly 100% of your barrel, whereas you can do with a keg product. So from a really retailer's perspective, you're like, well, what a second, yield's a problem, I can't get 100% out of it, I really have to look after this. If I bump into the darn thing in the cellar, I've got the flocks all over the place. Um, cask drinkers can be extremely challenging. You know, we were the first managed operator to put um, cask mark, which is a quality of cask, in our managed estate. We were kind of front and centre at the Great British Beer Festival. Uh, Dennis Rutledge, who was the PR man, I say, was just phenomenal. And then, as we saw the volumes decline, and we weren't able to move the volume out of the barrel fast enough, we said, what we'll do is we'll put a CO2 blanket on the top. Just a blanket. I mean, the pressure is less than what you get during a thunderstorm. Long story, but ended up, we ended up getting thrown out of the Great British Beer Festival, all sorts of stuff. I mean, this thing went on, I can't remember, for like two decades. And about five years ago, camera have now admitted the fact that there is nothing wrong with aspiration. You know, if you put quality ingredients in and your ABV is correct, there is no reason why cask should be cheaper than keg. And it should be more expensive because of the challenges of keeping it and the challenges with yield. It, it, it's been, in my opinion, it's been a strategic mistake for a long time. And you know, when retailers like ourselves have found ourselves in conflict with camera on the subject, it's in no one's interest because our retailers are like, why, why can't we just have keg? You know, the quality of kegged products now is phenomenal. The, the taste is great. Um, you know, it keeps really easily. You get 100% out of it. You get much more margin out of it. Um, but I'm still sentimental about cask because, you know, AK, 1833. Because we're a heritage brewer, the one thing that was very clear with the craft market is they didn't want the heritage brewers coming in because the image was this was all cool, young and contemporary and you guys are all old duffers and you'll contaminate our brand if you come in. And that was entirely understandable. And so, and, it was, and it's interesting, so our, our reputation as a business was probably fair to say McMullen's in the pub operating side had a reputation for being that lovely blend of old traditional family values but also really forward thinking progressive competence um, and so our pubs were that but our beer was still very much seen in the old bracket and there'd been no progressive innovation for a while and so what we had this gradual process of trying to develop brands quietly and subtly mainly using that ambush brewery and then mainly just quietly going into London pubs with unbranded beer, getting people to go, oh, you know, I do like this. Because, and it's interesting, you know, we, there was, and then when we started to sort of push it in a little bit harder and people started to realise it was us brewing it. Because actually we were very clear, you know, this is Rivertown Brewing. It's not Rivertown Brewery. We're not claiming there's another brewery. No, it's just, it's a different concept and process. But obviously, there were some people who then like started to go, oh, okay, this is, we think this is McMullen's brewing it. Yeah, and there was a, you know, not a lot, but they were immediately very negative. So like, you can't do this, this is just, this is McMullen's, it's going to be crap. Um, and, and so we had to get around that slowly. And, and we have now won that argument, yeah. um, but we had to st sort of help them stop seeing this as old store fuddy McMullen's brewing, and it, it can be something different. And I think we have got to that space where they go, okay, no, you can do. So, and, and now we're much more open about Rivertown being part of our stable. Whereas, you know, the first couple of years we couldn't be. The craft movement was a backlash to the established brewers. Yeah. It will be interesting to see whether cast becomes a backlash to the craft movement. Uh, what an experience. Um, what an eccentric um, sort of historical tour. Um, really intriguing. Great to see the buy-in here from everyone, just the whole community, the heritage behind the brewery, the fact that they really care about the estate and all the staff. Um, so incredible insight into McMullins. Um, we hope you check them out online. And if you're in the area, make sure you pop in and get a pint of beer. And until next time, happy brewing.